Welcome back. Good afternoon. Did you have a good break? Can I have the microphone? Thank you. Good. So the last time, that's a long time ago, we talked about equilibria, and we've seen you have an equilibrium, you have reactants and you have products, and you can have an equilibrium between phase changes, where you have a liquid and a gaseous uh, form of one and the same compound in equilibrium, and this would be at, at uh, one atmosphere pressure, that equilibrium would be at 100 degrees Celsius, where you have the liquid water with the gaseous water with the steam in equilibrium. You can have gas phase equilibrium. This is here, this is a heterogeneous equilibrium. You have two different phases. This is a homogeneous phase. You have both phases, a homogeneous equilibrium, you have both phases in the gas phase. Can you hear me in the back? Can you hear me well? Okay, thank you. And here we have an aqueous equilibrium where you have acetic acid dissolved in water, gives H3O plus or H plus in the aqueous phase, and the acetate ion, anion in the aqueous phase. And then we talked about a heterogeneous equilibrium again. We have two aqueous uh, phase-based uh, ions, silver plus and chloride minus. And then we have silver chloride, which is a solid. And this is a heterogeneous equilibrium because this is in the aqueous phase and this is in the, gas, uh, in the solid phase. Now, you know how to write these equilibria. So you can write a quotient for the equilibrium. The quotient is not the equilibrium. So the quotient is you mix A and B. And for example, you don't have C and D. You mix A and B, you can write a quotient. Okay. And the quotient is the concentration of the products, that's the C and D. Of course, don't forget the stoichiometric factor here. That's the exponent here, C exponent, D exponent, divided by the concentration of the reactants, A and B. And again, don't forget the, quotient, the, the stoichiometric factor as the exponent here. And so you have many, many different Qs you can have when this is not in equilibrium. So if I mix this together, and I know that it's not in equilibrium, and I take samples in milliseconds, or billions, every billions, billions of a second I take a sample, and I determine the concentration of A, B, C, and D, I will have every time a different concentration. With this, I will have every time a different Q. That's the reaction quotient at that specific point. But you are not in equilibrium. You only are in equilibrium when Q equals that equilibrium constant, equals K. And so it goes that long that we actually change this Q until Q has reached K, and then you're in equilibrium. Okay, and you can look up these equilibrium constants for certain reactions, and it's at a fixed temperature. The K is dependent on the temperature, that equilibrium constant. And when you're in equilibrium, the universe doesn't care if it's products or reactants, the delta G naught equals zero because you're in equilibrium. Before, of course, if delta G naught is smaller than zero and you write this reaction like this, the reaction goes in this direction from left to right. If delta G naught is larger than zero, that reaction does not go in the way you have written it here. It will perhaps go into the opposite direction. All right, that's the question of course kinetic. So now if you analyze this Q here, Let's say Q is at standard state. When we calculate, for example, these enthalpies of uh, reaction, we use the enthalpies of formation at standard state and take the sum of the products minus the sum of the reactants, and this gives you the standard uh, state reaction enthalpy, the heat that is generated or uh, released or absorbed by that reaction. So if you have now Q at standard state, what is the concentration if you are in aqueous solution? What is everything? Everything is one mole. So if you have one mole here, one mole here, one mole here, you can have this stoichiometric coefficient as you want. It still be, it will be one. Q is one if you're at standard state. But it's not equilibrium. If you have gases, then you have partial pressures, and the partial pressures we set to are set at one atmosphere. This will be one. And this is not equilibrium. So now we have several cases. If Q is smaller than K, Q is smaller than K. What does this mean? Q is smaller than K. That means you don't have enough enough uh, on the numerator here, and that means you have too many reactants and not enough products. So with this, you, the, the reaction will generate more products until it comes to K. That value. Okay? And when the value is, has reached K, then you're in equilibrium. Now, the other case is that Q is larger than K, so that means the reaction has to adjust, adjust itself until Q equals K. And if Q is larger than K, that means you have too many reactants, uh, too many products, and not enough reactants, so you have to make more of those here until it is K. You don't do anything, actually. The reaction will do that. Okay? And so there's these two cases, and when Q equals K, then you're in equilibrium. Okay? So we have done talked about how to write these equilibrium uh, quotients. So if you have a liquid, a liquid water, liquid water is a pure phase, we set the concentration of the activity as 1. If you have a solid, a pure solid, the activity or concentration is set as 1. So when you have here liquid water is in equilibrium with uh, water, gas, or steam, so then it's the concentration of this, that is the, uh, pressure, the, uh, the partial pressure of H2O, uh, divided by H2O in the liquid phase, but this is 1, with this Q equals just the partial pressure of H2O. And at, at 100 degrees, that is in equilibrium. Okay? And if you have, you can write this reverse here, then it would be, uh -huh, this is Q equals reactants, uh, uh, products divided by reactants, so this is set to 1, 1 over the partial pressure of your reactants, as this 1 over pH2O. So be very careful how the reaction is written when you derive your Q and your K, especially if you look up K. Now, then we talked about different kinds how equilibrium can be reached. So there's a monotonic way. You mix your stuff, and there is a certain concentration, and then you reach equilibrium. And once you have equi reached equilibrium, then the concentration of the partial pressure doesn't change anymore. You can have a clock reaction. We did this with these three of your colleagues who were standing there. And depending on how, what, how we had that mixture, there was first the first one became blue, and there was some time delay in between. This would be the time delay. Then the reaction happened, and then it got into equilibrium, became blue, and then you had even a third one where this was longer extended, longer, and then it did the reaction, and then it got equilibrium. We had this very nice oscillatory reaction where we overshot the equilibrium, we or the solution, overshot and then undershot the equilibrium. The one uh, uh, extreme was being yellow and the other was blue, and it went from yellow to blue and yellow to blue and yellow to blue. And you could notice that it was a little fast. It became faster and faster, the, the time between blue and red. So it was reaching closer to equilibrium, and eventually it would have been a mixture of blue and red, and it would have been in equilibrium. And then we had, at the end, we had a chaotic reaction, which we did not have, actually, because these reactions you cannot predict, but they will eventually reach equilibrium. So coming as a warm up, we have iodine, and iodine is a solid. Listen carefully, iodine is a solid, okay? So an iodine gas is a gas. And I'm asking you, what happens to the vapor color intensity when I add more iodine here? Does the intensity of the color stay the same? It gets darker, it increases, or gets lighter, it decreases. So what you need to do is you need to form your equilibrium constant or the reaction quotient in equilibrium, and then you see what happens if you do any of these changes or if any of these changes happen. So think about it and give me your answer.
By forming the K for this or the Q, you have the answer if you look carefully at it. Okay. How did you get to that? Some of you might maybe right, especially the person in E, the two of them. Uh, so how did you get to that? So why don't you look at your equilibrium expression? Say Q equals whatever your equilibrium expression is, and at equilibrium equals K. What does it depend on only? So you know solids and liquids, the concentration, fewer solids and fewer liquids, the concentration is set to what? To one. Why don't you do that and then try to answer that again and discuss this with each other, please? And see if we can come up with a more coherent solution. We is means you, actually. I sort of know the answer. What is it? <laughs> so this is sort of like something like this here, isn't it? Something like this here, isn't it? OK. So what does this depend on only? Which pressure? I do it again. No! <laughs> OK. So let's see. You have water. And you have water sitting here at this temperature. We're not changing the temperature. What's the partial pressure at this temperature of water? The partial pressure of water at this temperature, at room temperature. 3,000 of an atmosphere, is that right? 0 0.0321. OK. Now I have a little beaker with water. Now I have a big bucket with water. And now I have the whole room full of water. What is the partial pressure? Uh-huh. It's the same, isn't it? OK. Now let's do a little experiment and see that you believe me, what I just said. And let's do this with iodine. If I could have the front camera, please. So I have iodine here. A little bit. Yeah, OK. Very good. So I have some iodine solid. I'm going to add some solid to this. Ooh. OK. You see any difference here? Of course, it's the partial pressure of iodine at 25 degrees. Not going to change. Yes, of course, you have more surface. Then you have more atoms going into the air, but the same partial pressure. And with this, the answer was the same. And let's have a look at this, why this is. I explained it. So this, these are it's sublimes, iodine sublimes. It doesn't have a liquid phase in this, in this temperature. It goes directly from the solid to the gas phase. Did you experience a compound or a molecule which does the same thing before in this lecture? The sublimes, anything? Carbon dioxide, exactly. It goes from the solid to the gaseous state. That's sublimation here. And so what is K? It's the concentration of this. So this is a gas. We took the partial pressure here, divided by the concentration of this. But this is a pure solid, isn't it right? So that would be divided by 1. And this is just the partial pressure of iodine. And that's the vapor pressure of iodine at that temperature. And of course, the vapor pressure is not changing. If you have 10 million atoms or 5 atoms, the same vapor pressure. Okay. And with this, it's independent of the solid. And this was the correct answer, as many of you had so perfectly solved. Okay. All right. So because it was so much fun, let's do another one. So we have this iodine sublimation, the darnic uh, equilibrium again. Now what tape happens to the vapor color intensity when I heat up or when, the, when I raise the temperature of the equilibrium? That means the equilibrium constant is dependent on the temperature. We have, uh, have established this. K for water at 25 degrees is 3 uh, thousandths of an atmosphere. At 100 degrees, it's one atmosphere. That's the equilibrium pressure. Okay. So what happens if I heat this up when the, I raise the temperature? Does the intensity of the vapor increase, stay the same, or decrease? That's the question that I would like you to think about, please. And this will bring us right into the gist of today's lecture, the temperature dependence of the equilibrium constant. If you would think of a phase diagram, that would be something you could figure it out. That's the discussion already? How did you figure that out? It's correct. The majority has it. How did you figure this out? I don't understand if you couldn't figure out how because I taught you the first one. Actually, it has nothing to do with the first one. But so I tried to have it this morning and I can't figure out how you found out. So is this intuitive? OK. Why don't you use the time for discussion to tell your neighbor? Excuse me, please, ma'am. Can you tell me that I can laugh too? I love to laugh, as you know. So if, if use the time when you have the discussion for you telling the person what you did during spring break next to you, OK, that would make it much easier for me to teach. And also for some of you who really would like to pay attention to it. OK, so that was a good answer, having said that. So K is just the intensity of the vapor pressure. That means uh, the vapor pressure is temperature dependent. As you know, it went up in for water. It goes up in temperature. And you could think about, for example, of a phase diagram. I don't have a phase diagram for iodine. What is the phase diagram here? Water. Exactly. Excellent. So what I use this one, I use this here. OK? I said, that's what it's in equilibrium. The temperature goes up. What happens? The pressure goes up. Right? And if the pressure goes up, the, the partial pressure of the vapor, what does it mean? That the uh, color increases. So that was, I think, for some of you, intuitively you did that. And now we're going to talk to you about this uh, in a more, uh, in an even more educated fashion. So we'll talk about equilibrium and the principle of Mr. Le Chatelier. And then we'll talk a little bit about a very important synthesis and then about multiple equilibria. So you remember that here. That was NO2. NO2 
Hello, Beijing, okay? Or a little bit of Los Angeles home, okay? And, and so this is NO2, is a colored gas that has this orange-brown color, and N2O4 is the equilibrium product of this, so this dimerizes to NO2 forms one N2O4, and this is a mixture of this, and equilibrium is a mixture, and it's still brown. So if the equilibrium goes to this side, that means if, if by some reason it goes to this side here, then it would become darker, and the equilibrium goes to this side, is shifted to this side, then it would become lighter, all right? So at 25 degrees, and we have seen that before, K is 6.8, that means K is larger than one, that means reactant products are made, are being made, okay? The equilibrium, as we say, so sloppy, lies on the right side, because K is larger than one, is 6.8. We know also that this is exothermic, exothermic. Now that means you could write the, the heat that comes out of this exothermic as a reaction product. You say plus E here, it's a reaction product. And so if you have uh, an endothermic reaction, you write it as a reactant, you say E, Plus this here gives that reaction. That would be endothermic. And you see that it's exothermic because of the standard enthalpy of reaction is a negative sign here, so at 25 degrees. So Q is then the partial pressure of N2O4 divided by the partial pressure of NO2 because these are both gases. But you square that because you have the two factor here, so the square partial pressure of NO2. And at equilibrium at a fixed temperature, this is K. It will adjust itself until it has the value of 6.8 uh, when you have it not in equilibrium. In equilibrium, it will, this will have a value of 6.8. All right. So now let me ask you a question. That's a difficult question. You have this stuff here, N2O4. You have this in a flask here, and you have a vacuum here. Okay. And this is the same size than this here, the same volume. So now you start out with this amount of this, this gas here. And when I open that valve, of course, that gas goes into here and distributes itself evenly. What is it then? The first question is that you have to ask yourself, is it in equilibrium when it does that? Or does it come to equilibrium then? And how would it come to equilibrium? Uh, what is the color intensity when it's in equilibrium? Will it be darker? Will it increase? Will it no change in color? Or will it decrease? So that's a tricky question, but it will help you understand that. Why don't you try to answer this? I'm not expecting you that you will be answering this correctly. But you may. What can you say about the volume? This is volume. This is V. What's that volume? Excellent. OK. So what happens to the partial pressure then? If you know why, it would be even the test. Good. Very good. There you go. Let's do it. Hmm, that was the first step. You need to go one step further, some of you at least. So let's talk a little bit more about this. So you have a partial pressure here. This is the partial pressure of NO2 and the partial pressure of N2O4, okay? You know how to write that equilibrium constant for this. But now you have double the volume. What happens to the partial pressures? Okay, and now you need to see, now it's out of equilibrium, now it has to come back into equilibrium, that Q equals K. If you're out of equilibrium, once you open this, it's out of equilibrium. And now it has to come back to equilibrium. So why don't you discuss this with each other, please, and see if you can refine your answer, some of you. So yeah, you know that you have twice the volume now. So you write Q, how many Ks is Q? Yeah. Hmm? You got it right. Oh, I didn't show you that here, huh? I didn't show you this here, the temperature. Did we, we do the temperature increase, we did, didn't we? That's a perfect Gaussian distribution. So you have half the partial pressures here. When you have to ice the volume, when you open it up, you have half the partial pressures. So why don't we say, ah, uh -huh, there it is. Why don't we say Q equals K in equilibrium? That was on the left bulb, right? And now we have half the partial pressures. Why don't we put half the partial pressure of this here and half the partial pressure squared of this here? What would we get? That's twice the volume gives half the partial pressure. Q is one half the partial pressure of N2O4 divided one half of the partial pressure of NO2 squared. So you can cancel one one half against this one half, and you still have one half in the denominator. So if you bring that one half up there, 